welcome everybody to our plenary conference of computer science during this uh, CCE 2015 uh, conference. So we are very pleased to present Professor Polish Sarkar from the Applied Statistical uh, Unit of Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata, India. So I will read some uh, brief biography of uh, Professor Sarkar. Polish Sarkar received uh, his Bachelor of Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering degree from Jadapur University in Kolkata in 1991, and the Masters of Technology in Computer Science from Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata in 1993. He received the PhD degree from Indian Statistical Institute in 1999, and since June 2005, Professor Sarkar uh, is a professor at the India, Indian Statistical Institute. His research interests include cryptology, discrete math, in computer science. He was the recipient of the prestigious Shanti Swarup Badnagar yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Award for Mathematical uh, Science for the year 2011, and the co-recipient -reci co of the BM Birla Award for Mathematics uh, for the year 2005. So we are very pleased to present uh, Professor Sarkar, who is going to talk about digital signatures, a panoramic view, so please. Okay, yeah, so the microphone works. So thank you, Francisco, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks, of course, for inviting me, and uh, which gives me the opportunity to visit Mexico and Sinvesta. So I've been collaborating with Debru over the years on, on several works, also with Francisco. And uh, this is the first time I have been able to make it here. So thanks, yes. So uh, my talk is going to be on uh, digital signatures. Now, as uh, Francisco mentioned, that uh, it's supposed to be a, a plenary or a keynote talk. Now, for such a talk, I thought that maybe I should try to uh, give a, a broad-based talk rather than speaking about any particular topic on which uh, I have actually worked on. So, uh, so I gave it a very ambitious title of a panoramic view. Now, those of you who who take photographs, who know that a panoramic view is ne necessarily a wide-angle view, and any wide-angle view distorts. So there will be some distortion. So that's the <laughs> caveat uh, stuff. OK. So uh, I want to talk about several things. Of course, uh, we'll start with public key encryption and digital signatures, uh, some brief background on that. I'll give you two examples of digital signatures kind of basic examples, the RSA-based uh, digital signatures and the elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. Uh, these are the two most popularly used uh, signature algorithms right now. Uh, we'll talk about how digital signatures actually work in, in the internet, which, which will bring up this uh, idea of uh, public key infrastructure. And then comes bitcoins, which is in the last uh, five, seven years is the most uh, interesting application of digital, practical application of digital signatures uh, that have come up. So I'll spend a few slides talking about bitcoins a bit. Also to emphasize how bitcoins avoid using uh, public infrastructure. So this, uh, this first four uh, topics with kind of a generic overview kind of thing. Uh, the next two is, going to be more academic oriented. So there are people here who would be interested in um, taking up research in digital signatures. For them, I'd like to say something. So this two would be more, more academically oriented. And uh, well, if, you're, if, you, if you're not really into, if you do not really want to get into digital signatures, this would be a good time for you to take a little nap. I'll wake you when you come back to the more interesting things about e-commerce and uh, law and information technology act and so on. And then I'll try to finish off with uh, some real world attacks on PKI. Some things how, how PKI has actually been uh, attacked. Well, by essentially bypassing uh, the, the cryptography that has been put, put there. So that would be also, this, so this, these two things should be of more interest. Okay, so let's start with uh, the background, so the, the background science, of course, is uh, cryptology. And broadly speaking, one can think of two basic tasks. 
encryption and authentication. And uh, I mean, if you're, if you're already a cryptologist, you know this. But if you're not, then you may have heard of uh, things called asymmetric key or public key crypto system. So two basic uh, notions or two basic approaches to uh, designing uh, cryptography. It, these are very broad classifications. So one is this uh, conventional or classical notion, which is secret or symmetric crypto system, which was uh, the, the only notion of cryptography until the 1970s. And uh, in 1976, Diffie and Hellman came up with their with the seminal paper, New Directions in Cryptography, which you give this paradigm shift uh, of introducing asymmetric crypto system, at least in the public world, in the confidential world, in the government world, this was uh, supposedly proposed earlier, but we need not bother about that. There are three uh, things that uh, constitute asymmetric crypto system, three broad things. Public key agreement, public key encryption, and digital signatures. I'll talk a bit about public key encryption, and mostly about digital signatures. Public key agreement I'll skip for, for this talk. Now, uh, this is not to suggest that, uh, that uh, public key encryption systems, or asymmetric crypto systems, have uh, superseded uh, symmetric key crypto system. In practice, it's actually a combination of symmetric and asymmetric key crypto, crypto systems that are used. But for this talk, we won't be talking about symmetric key crypto systems at all. OK. So here is a uh, brief one slide overview of what is meant by public key encryption. I'll try to explain this a bit uh, for the benefit of some people who may not be familiar with, with crypto. The basic task in crypto, of course, is, uh, is for a sender, so in this case, Alice, who wants to send a message M to Bob, so this, this dashed line. This uh, represents the transmission of the message M from Alice to Bob, and the requirement is, uh, basic requirement is confidentiality. So you want to send the message across, but you don't want anybody else, typically called an adversary, to learn this message. And uh, you do not have, I mean, you do not have a, a means or a communication medium which is controlled only by Alice and Bob. So you have to send this message over a, a public, so, so called public channel. So you have to transfer, you think of this as a bit sequence which you have to send over a public channel so that anybody who, who has access to the public channel can get to know this message in. Now, if you want confidentiality, you cannot directly send it. So you do it via this procedure. So apply a, a transformation called encryption on the message to produce what is called a ciphertext, which is sent across the public channel. And then that is decrypted by Bob to get back the original message. So these two, this encryption and decryption, these two transformations are inverses of each other. And designing these transformations constitute essentially uh, the task of, of, of a cryptographer. Now, uh, this. Encryption and decryption, these are parameterized by keys. This is a PK and an SK. In the conventional model of uh, cryptography, this symmetric key crypto system, these two would be same, and both would be secret. Uh, the, the, the paradigm shift proposed by Diffie and, and Hellman is that this, the encryption key can be made public, so anybody can encrypt a message, which would be sent across the public channel. And uh, there is a corresponding secret key, which only Bob would know. And this secret key will allow the decryption of the ciphertext to the original message. So this, uh, this differentiating between the public key and the secret key, that is the, the most ingenious idea that was proposed by Diffie and Hellman, though there could not be a solution to it. That was given by uh, Louis Shamir and Adelman, uh, the RSA crypto system. So, uh, so the, the receiver, Bob, has a public key and a secret key. The public key is published in a, in a public directory, so everybody knows the public key, and only Bob knows the secret key. So this is how encryption works. Uh, and we look at digital signatures, which is what the content of this talk is about. Well, in a digital signature, the goal is different. The goal is not to obtain the confidentiality of the message. So the message. And Bob is not concerned about uh, hiding the message. What Bob is concerned about, or rather what Alice is concerned about, is that 
Bob says, I mean, this, this is an instruction that Bob sends. So, so things like, so Bob tells a bank to pay some amount of money to Alice. So typically a check. Right? So you're not really bothered about the confidentiality of the check. Though that could be an additional concern, but that's not the basic concern when you sign a check. When you sign a check, what you, what you want, really want to do is to be able to say that, well, Bob has signed the check telling the bank that he pay a certain amount of money to Alice. So how to do that in the digital world? Well, that's the basic, uh, and that's what digital signatures try to capture. So when, again, there is this public channel, but here the message M is, and the goal is not to hide the message M. So you have two trans transformations, the sign and verify, well, two algorithms really. So this message M is signed by Bob using what is called a secret key or a signing key of Bob. So only Bob knows the signing key. So Bob will apply this signing key and uh, will apply the signature algorithm with the signing key uh, to the message M and produce the signature sigma. So this sigma is the signature of Bob on the message M. And this is what will go across. Okay. Now, who can verify? Well, anybody can verify. Anybody can run this algorithm. This is a verification algorithm. Anybody can run this algorithm. And there is a corresponding verification key, which is the public key of Bob. So run the verification algorithm with the public key of Bob on this message signature pair. And this verification algorithm will say whether this is a properly signed message or not. So the answer is going to be yes or no. Okay, so that's the goal of digital signatures. And I mean, as we can see, it's different from that of encryption. Now, in many typical scenarios, you require both. So both encryption and signatures. And there are ways of dealing with that, something called sign encryption. So maybe I'll briefly talk about it later. But the, the main goal here is uh, to sign a particular message. So Bob signs a message. And uh, that is done in, this, uh, in the setting of public key crypto system, where there is a public key which is available to everybody, and there is a signing key which is available only to Bob. So a digital signature scheme will consist of three procedures. There is a setup procedure, which generates the public key and the secret key for Bob. This public key is made public. It is placed in a public directory. Everybody gets to know it. There is a signature algorithm, a signing algorithm. Bob signs a message in using the secret key, using his secret key, top 10 signature sigma. And Alice or any other party can verify the validity of, of this message signature pair using the public key of Bob. And for verification, no, no secret information is required. OK. Now, uh, when we talk about signatures, well, we are talking about sending a message. You know, a message can be long. Most signature schemes are based on algebraic operations, number theoretic operations, or operations on uh, and things called elliptic curves and so on. So these are uh, computationally expensive operations. So if you're trying to sign a very long message, then uh, your signing time goes up quite a lot. So the engineering solution to this is to use what is called a hash then sign paradigm. So what, what does this do? Well, if you want to sign a long message, you apply a hash function to the message to produce a short diagram. So what is a hash function? Hash function is a function which will take in a bit string, a long bit string, and produce a short fixed length bit, bit string. And uh, the fixed length could be 160 bit, 256 bit, these are the two standard things. Uh, it has to satisfy certain properties, like the collision resistance, so it should be computationally difficult to find two messages which map to the same value. Of course, there will be such things because your, your domain is larger than your range, so there will be collisions, but it should be difficult to find them. Uh, if, if, if it is indeed possible to find such things, then if you are trying to design a, a signature scheme based on such a hash function, then that will be insecure. So the hash function, the function which maps with bit strings to short strings, must be collision resistance. It must also be pre-image resistant in the sense that if you're given a digest, it should be computationally difficult to find a pre-image which maps to this digest. Okay. And there are some standards. NIST is this uh, it's a standardization body of the United States. They have standardized uh, certain hash functions, SHA-1. SHA-1 is no longer considered to be secure. 
the SHA-2 is considered to be secure. Uh, it has two options of producing 256-bit digest or 512-bit digest. And very recently, the NIST has concluded a, a multi-year uh, competition to select a, a new hashing algorithm called SHA-3. So how the entire hash then uh, sign paradigm works is, well, you have this long message, you hash it into a short value, and then apply the signature scheme on the short value. Now we come to uh, examples of digital signatures. I'll talk about two examples, as I mentioned, the RSA and the ECDSA. Well, this is the, the basic RSA signature scheme. Uh, for actual applications, this need to be, and there are more details that, that would be required. So th there are three algorithms for any signature scheme, set up, sign, and verify. In the RSA signature scheme, well, set up will be performing these operations. And uh, it'll come up with a, with a public key or the verification key and a signing key, D. So this E and D are two integers such that ED is congruent to 1 mod phi of n, where phi is the Euler quotient, which gives you the number of uh, integers between 1 and n minus 1, which are co-prime to n. And n itself is a product of two primes, P and Q, where two are put safe primes because there is a lot that needs to be said about how to choose these primes. Uh, and uh, in addition, there is a hash function h, which maps bit strings. So this is the hash then sign paradigm, which would map bit strings to this set, 0 to n minus 1. So this is the verification key. This is my public. And uh, this is the secret key, which Bob keeps to himself. How, the, how, how to sign? Well, your message m is a bit string. You first hash it. To, to get an integer between 0 and n minus 1, call it y, and then just raise y to the power d. d is the signing key. So y to the power d mod n. Well, this, this is the signature. Signature on m is sigma. And uh, well, verification is, again, the message is not, on the, it's not a secret. So the person who is trying to verify the message can apply this hash, fun hash function h to m and uh, to get y, and accept if and only if sigma to the power e mod n is y, and this works because uh, sigma to the power e is y to the power d to the power e, which is y to the power e d mod n, which equals y. This requires a bit of an argument. We'll skip that. So this is uh, simple enough. And uh, signing is essentially one exponentiation modulo n. And verification is also one exponentiation modulo n. So that's the computational cost of signing and verifying. And security, well, there is a lot to be said about uh, security of RSA signatures, but fundamentally it is based on the assumption that factoring a suitably chosen composite number is computationally hard. So if you can choose your primes, P and Qs, appropriately, then this uh, decomposing n as P into Q is hard. See, P and Q are once they are they are chosen once for all, and then you don't need them anymore. Now, how hard it is? Well, that depends on the size of the integer. So 1024-bit n currently is considered to be uh, to provide about 80-bit security. The recommendation is, and there are various recommendations. You go up to 2048 or 4096-bit uh, modulus. The, the only thing is that as you increase the size of your modulus, these two operations become more and more costly. So these exponentiations, this and this, they become more and more costly. So there is a trade-off. You just cannot arbitrarily increase the security. You also need to think of the efficiency. Okay, so this is the basic RSA signature scheme. Uh, then I would like to talk about ECDSA, and that involves elliptic curves. So this is a one-page summary of elliptic curves. <laughs> and as I said, I mean, any any panoramic view will distort. Mm -hmm. So this is. Uh, I hope it will give you some idea of what what it means. But uh, this by no means complete. Okay, so we will have in the as uh, the underlying uh, algebra, a finite field, Fq. And then look at such a curve. So this is y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. This is, uh, this is called an elliptic curve with certain conditions. And what we're interested in is, or rather, our pairs, alpha, beta. So alpha and beta are elements of Fq, which satisfy this equation. So beta squared is alpha cubed plus e alpha plus b. So we, we are looking at, we are interested in pairs alpha beta elements of fq, which satisfy this equation. 
Then it can be shown that EFQ forms an abelian group, and you don't do your cryptography over the entire group. You do, the cryptography is done over a large prime order, and hence cyclic subgroup of EFQ. Now, how do you choose this group? How do you choose this curve? And so on. Well, there is a lot of deep theory behind it, which is not required for our purposes. And uh, this, as I mentioned, characteristic not equal to two or three. Well, if characteristics is two or three, then there are other forms of elliptic curve. You don't use this equation, you use something else. But uh, I think uh, what the main, main point here is we'll be interested in, in pairs of elements of finite fields satisfying such equations. And uh, these form an abelian group. With this background, we can get into this NIST standard ECDSA, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. And this is a very bare description. There are lots of details that I've skipped on how to choose the curves and so on and so forth. First is that there are some domain parameters. This would be shared by all users who use this ECDSA. These domain parameters would involve this Q. Q would define this finite field FQ. Q could be a large prime. And for the purpose of and for the purpose of understanding this talk, just consider Q to be a large enough prime. Uh, so FQ is, is the field of cardinality Q. And you have an elliptic curve E over FQ. And as I mentioned, that uh, cryptography would be done over a suitable uh, subgroup of EFQ. Let G be the generator of this subgroup. So E, Q, E, and G, and N, of course, is the is the order of of this subgroup. So these are the parameters which are uh, associated with the elliptic curve. In addition, we have a hash function H. Okay, so that's the domain parameters. So all users would be having these domain parameters to set up. Well, the signing key is D, and the verification key, key is this Q. So the signing key is, is an integer chosen uniformly at random between 1 and n minus 1. So leave out the 0, but uh, and the, the, the group order is n. So you choose an uh, integer between 1 and n minus 1. And that's your, going to be your signing key. And the verification key is going to be D times G. So the group is written additively. It's G plus G plus G up to D times. Okay, so signing and uh, verification, these are the algorithms, uh, look a little complicated, I'll try to explain them a bit. So the message M is, uh, the message is still M, and the signature on M is RS, these are uh, two integers, modulo N. How are these obtained? Well, first you hash the message uh, to get E, and uh, then uh, do something on E uh, to get this S. OK, so what do you do on E? Well, you see, this is where this, this signing key comes in, this D, which is the signing key, it comes in here. And it also involves an R and a K. Well, the K is chosen uniformly at random from 1 and n minus 1. And R is, well, once you choose K, then you do G plus G plus G K times. And that will give you a point on the elliptic curve. And this point on the elliptic curve will, will be two elements of FQ which you call x1, y1, and think of q as a large prime. So these are going to be elements uh, in the finite field. So they're going to be integers between 0 and uh, q minus 1. And uh, let r be x1 modulo n. So there you get this integer r modulo n. So r is going to be between 0 and n minus 1. And then s is k inverse e plus dr modulo n. So the signature on m is r and s. Verification is essentially to recreate from this, uh, from given, from M and S, re try to recreate this R. That's essentially what this verification algorithm does. So I won't get into the details. I mean, you can recreate this E, of course, by applying the hash uh, function to M. And then do some computation to get this V. And if V equals R, so your recreation of, of R has been successful. Then the message is uh, then the message signature period is accepted. Else it is rejected. Uh, correctness follows from uh, some just a few simple algebraic steps, which uh, skip for a moment. It's not important. So the cost here, the essential cost here is this k times g. So g plus g plus g k times. This is called a one. This is called a scalar multiplication. So signing costs one scalar multiplication. And verification, well, here is this operation of getting x. 
which is u1 g plus u2 q, u1 and u2 are two integers, uh, modulo n. So this is again g plus g plus g up to u1 times, and this is adding q to itself u2 times. So these are two scalar multiplications. So verification takes two scalar multiplication, while uh, signing takes one scalar multiplication. That's the cost. Well, security, the security of uh, ECDSA is based on the fact that uh, the discrete lock problem, the so-called discrete lock problem for certain elliptic curve groups is computationally difficult. And uh, well, factoring also I mentioned is computationally difficult, but there is a, there is a difference between the computational difficulty. For factoring, there are, there are what are called sub-exponential algorithms. So they, while they are not very efficient, they are somewhat efficient. Whereas for, uh, for the discrete lock problem on certain, certain properly chosen elliptic curve groups, uh, you do not have anything other than essentially uh, trying a, a, a naive search, which is call, also called the Pollard's row algorithm. So the, I mean, to put it in, in, in broad perspective, solving the discrete lock problem on elliptic curve is assumed to be more difficult than solving factoring. Uh, very broadly speaking, that would be the, uh, the current state of knowledge. And since uh, this is considered to be more difficult, the advantage is that one can work with smaller size groups. So your, your Q can be much smaller than this 2048-bit RSA modulus. Hence, uh, your keys, your signatures, etc., everything is shorter. And also the, the signing and verification algorithms are shorter. So if you have been using your, uh, your net or anything, then uh, as I speak, speak about, talk about a little later, you probably have used the RSA signature, which is, I think, still RSA is, is uh, mostly used, or maybe the ECDSA, even without you knowing it. It's not that we don't get to use it. We are using it without actually knowing it. OK. Now comes uh, the issue of public key infrastructure. So how to trust a public key? I, as I mentioned, that uh, there is an issue that, uh, so, so Bob wants, I mean, you can think of it as two, way, uh, two ways, one in terms of encryption, the other in terms of signatures. So suppose Bob wants to send a message to Alice, encrypt a message, and send it to Alice. So Bob will be using Alice's public key, PKA. So Bob is on the net, there is somewhere, Alice is somewhere, okay, so Bob gets the public key of Alice, encrypts the the message using Alice's public key and sends it in good faith that Alice is the only person who can decrypt. Now, a, a classical uh, man in the middle would be that if, if somehow comes in between Alice and Bob and if puts out a, a public key, say PKE, saying this is the public key of Alice. Right? So how does Bob know? Which I mean that that this is the public key of Alice. How does Bob determine that? Okay. So if Bob gets PKE instead of PKA, well he encrypts his message using PKE, but then if can decrypt it. So there is no security. So the, all this security, etc., this completely vanishes. In the context of signatures, so what if can do is if can sign, well if puts out a public key in the name of Alice. So as PKE is the is Alice's public. Then she signs a message using the corresponding secret key and sends it to Bob. So Bob gets this PKE, thinks this is the public key of Alice, and verifies. Then what, what Bob gets is that he gets to gets a message signature and we, which verifies. So he gets a message signature pair which shows to him that Alice has signed it. So unless he can trust that this public key that he is using, this actually belongs to Alice, the whole system fails. Right? So this is, a, this is one of the fundamental problems of public key cryptography. So this is the man in the middle or woman in the middle, whatever you prefer. Uh, so Eve impersonates Alice. So it's just an impersonation attack. Puts a public key in the name of Alice and signs. So this is in the context of signature. So if puts a public key in the name of Alice and signs a message in using the secret key, corresponding secret key. And Bob verifies the signature using PKE and he thinks that he thinks is Alice's public key. So when can Bob trust that the public key is indeed that of Alice? 
Well, this problem has been solved using what is called a certifying authority. So you need an authority which is trusted by Bob. So here is a CA. What the CA will do is it will certify public keys. So Alice has a public key. Alice will send the public key to the CA. The CA is supposed to do a physical verification that this, this person is indeed Alice. So somebody claims I'm Alice. Well, that person is indeed Alice. The CA is supposed to do that physical verification. And then CA has its own public key and signing, uh, public key and signing key. It will use a signing key to sign Alice's public key and send back what is called a certificate to Alice. The certificate will consist of many things, but essentially it is the signature of the CA on the public key of Alice. Okay. Now when Bob wants to communicate with Alice, Bob will ask for Alice's public key. Alice will send her public key along with the certificate that she has received from CA. Now Bob has the public key of the CA. So, so this, this must be a uh, uh, an authenticated channel. So Bob somehow has to trust the public key of CA. So what Bob will do is, Bob will use the public key of CA and then verify the, uh, the CA signature on the public key of CA. So this is the certificate, uh, this is the signature of the CA on PKA. So Bob will use the public key of the CA to verify the CA signature, which is CERT A on PKA. If this verifies, then Bob has trust that this public key indeed belongs to Alice. And then Bob can do this usual, uh, send the cipher text uh, and use the public key for usual purposes. So this initial verification procedure is required. So the thing is, uh, okay, so here is this in more details. So CA would have uh, a key pair, public key C and uh, SKC and so on. So the ma main thing is that Bob has to trust the public key of the CA. And if Bob trusts the public key of the CA, and the signature algorithm is secure, then Bob will trust the public key of Alice. This is how things work. Now, there is an issue about management of certificates. So the CA is issuing certificates. The certificates are issued not for free, of course. So this is a business model. So certificates have a cost, and they are not issued for lifetime. They have a validity period. So the end. certificate is issued for a year, and then it expands. Or maybe for some reason Alice could have lost her private key. Somehow it has become compromised. So then she informs the CA that this public key no longer works. Okay. Uh, this, uh, I mean, this certificate is no longer valid. So Bob has to know that the certificate that Alice produces is fresh. That it is the current certificate of Alice. How, how, how will he get to know that? There are several ways of doing that. Uh, I mean, this, this is the certificate revocation list. So the, the CAs maintain what is called a certificate revocation list. So this is the list of all certificates that the CA has revoked. Now that has lots of problems. So they, I mean, the certificate, uh, designing proper certificate revocation list is a, is a problem. And then uh, there is a solution to it, this online certificate status protocol. So you can make an online query. Uh, to the server and check whether the certificate is fresh or not. So each one of them will have his own uh, advantages and disadvantages and so on. But there is clearly a need for management of certificates. So it's not, and certificates is not the end of the story. There is a clear need for management of certificates. And uh, well, the entire thing is called public key infrastructure. Uh, the, the, the standard, uh, and the accepted standard is X.509. Roughly the certificate format. Uh, this has several things. The signature algorithm ID, so it could be RSA or ECGSA. I think these are the two standard algorithms that are used. And several things. The, the most important thing is the certificate owner's public key and the CS signature on all of this. So this is, and these are all blah blah things, the documentary and kind of bookkeeping, bookkeeping information. But the main thing is the certificate owner's public key and the CA signature on, on everything. These two would constitute the, uh, the certificate for, the, uh, for, a, for a particular user. Okay, now uh, uh, talking about uh, public infrastructure wouldn't be complete without saying how it actually works in practice. 
So uh, again, these are broad topics. I've just summarized them into two, two bullet points. The transport layer security, and its predecessor was this secure sockets layer, and both are sometimes together called SSL. The goal is to create a secure channel between a client and a server. So how does TLS work? How does TLS work? Well, uh, the client opens a connection to the server and then asks for the server's public key. Okay. So the server sends uh, its public key and its certificate, and the client authenticates the server's certificate using the pu public key of the relevant CA. So this public key and certificate would have been signed by a particular CA. So the, the client would authenticate that. So the client could be a browser, for example. It would authenticate that uh, certificate using uh, the corresponding uh, corresponding public key of the C. Now once that is done, then the client knows it is working with, and it, it, it trusts the server. Now the server could also be asking the same thing from the client. Now once this, this mutual authentication has been established, what uh, the, the, the TLS protocol will do is, what the client will do is, client will take a random value, encrypt it using the, the public key of the server, and send it across. Well, then the server can decrypt it, get back that random value, and then both of them have the same random value. They apply some transformation to it to get a secret key, and then do then use symmetric key encryption to communicate. I mean, they have created a secure channel via this uh, this authentication and this transfer of secret. They have created an authenticated secret secure channel between the client and the server. Well, HTTPS writes piggyback on on TLS. So this is an HTTP connection that is open be between a browser and a, and a server. It uses TLS to create a secure HTTP connection. So your HTTP HTML code that is flowing across, it would first go through this uh, TLS protocol. So TLS would do this, uh, this certificate verification. And once that is done, well, then things are encrypted and sent across. So, so if you are using your, your credit card for some online transaction and so on, well, then, then you'd be using a site marked with HTTPS, and that would be using TLS to secure your connection. So as I said, that even if you don't uh, realize it, uh, it, it I mean, digital signatures are there. And it's part of this authentication of the server. I'll talk about two other tools. Uh, these are free tools. And one of the reasons I talk about them is that they're free. This is GPG and Tor. OK, so GPG is this GNU privacy guard. So it's a free tool which actually allows you to do this public key uh, um, signing, encryption, and so on. It gives you a lot of functionality. You can download it, you can install it, and then it allows you everything. This is compliant with open PGP. PGP is pretty good privacy. It was originally developed by Zimmerman. But uh, I think now it's a proprietary software. and. Uh, the, this GPG is the counterpart, which is free, so you can get it. It allows performing message signing, encryption, decryption, and so on, this generation of public private key pairs. Uh, okay, the other important application is Tor. The functionality of Tor is, uh, is really to provide privacy or anonymous communication. It directs traffic through a volunteer network of several thousand relays. So if a particular user is browsing the net, so it kind of tries to prevent somebody from knowing which sites a particular user is, is visiting. Well, that's actually a different application. Now, in the context of, why do I bring it up in the context of digital signature, is, uh, is for the following reason. So suppose you want to install Tor. Okay. So you have to download it from some site. So here is a site which says that this is my Tor script. This is the code for Tor. You download it, install it on your machine, and you run it as if it's Tor. But how do you know that that's actually the Tor, Tor uh, the, the original Tor algorithm? If somebody has a kind of like this man in the middle, somebody has put up a few, few software, a few programs saying that this is the Tor code. And once you download it, then there is no more security at all. So that's where digital signatures come in. The download side is this HTTPS. I put it in bold because they use this HTTPS connection. So it's a secure HTTP connection. And this is the actual site from which you can download this, this, uh, the Tor files. Each download file has a GPG signature. 
and the signing keys are publicly known and can be imported using this genuine feature. So if you do that, then you know that you are actually getting the original code, not, not something else. So, so even though the functionality is not really uh, uh, signatures, but without signatures, this, uh, I mean, you, you cannot really trust the, uh, the, the code that you have downloaded. And in the, towards the later half of the talk, we'll see how this can be a problem. OK, now that's uh, the public key infrastructure. That's the summary of public key infrastructure. Then I'll talk about bitcoins. Now, bitcoins is a form of uh, electronic cash or electronic, yeah, electronic cash would be the uh, appropriate thing. And it has been, yeah, I'm pretty sure all of you would have heard of bitcoins. Now, this is actually an application of digital signatures. And that's the reason I want to talk about it. Also, uh, they, I mean, the, the mo one of the most interesting things about bitcoins is that there is no trusted third party. So this CA, the certifying authority, that's a trusted third party. So by using a, a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network, bitcoins uh, do away with the trusted third party. And that's also a very interesting thing. And in fact, a lot of people have started saying that uh, we don't need PKI anymore. Try to, try to use the, the model uh, introduced by bitcoins to do away with PKI, completely do away with PKI. Whether that will be possible or not is a different thing, but uh, I think it's it's worthwhile that if you talk about di digital signatures today, uh, we should talk a bit about bitcoins. Okay. So what are bitcoins? You have essentially public keys, which are addresses, which are considered to be addresses. These are public keys. And they are created by a mining procedure. The actual mining procedure uh, doesn't concern us too much. And uh, well, there is some calculation. It shows that most of our 21 million bitcoins can be created. Each Bitcoin is divisible into 10 to the power 8 parts, and if required, divisibility can be increased. So the, the amount of Bitcoins is not a problem. And there is, there is a, a financial economic side to it. So if you have too many Bitcoins, then there could be inflationary measures and so on, things that I do not understand very well. But uh, if required, it can be increased. So you have a total number of Bitcoins is fixed, but each Bitcoin can be divided as, as many times as you want. So the amount of currency is not an issue. Okay, so bitcoins are owned by by public keys. So the important thing is transfer of ownership. So one public key owns it and wants to transfer it to another public. Now, how did this this original public key come to own it? Well, because of it, some some other transaction. Well, one transaction would trade it and then it would get transferred. That's how money rolls. It's traded by a central bank or something. There is no central bank here, of course. It's created and then it's just transactions. So transaction is the transfer of a, of a Bitcoin from one public key to another. Then what you do is, well, you sign the, the, the current owner, which is the public key. It signs a hash of the previous transaction. So this transaction record, it signs the hash of that and the public key of the new one. So take the previous transaction and wants to transfer it to somebody else, takes the public key of the new owner, hashes that using one of the hash functions. Well, it uses SHA-256 for hashing. And then whatever uh, the digest that is obtained, it signs that. So it signs and then it signs, and well, that's the transaction. And that, that tells, well, the, now the new, public, new owner is this new public. So it's also an anonymous network. You don't need to identify yourself. And that's one of the criticisms against Bitcoins that it could be used for illegal money, black money, smugglers, and so on. Uh, for good or bad, for our purposes, it's just public keys which own bitcoins and transfer. Transfers, transfer of bitcoin is essentially a, a digital signature protocol. And bitcoins use ECDSA for sign. Now, of course, uh, these are more technical parts that one transaction could have multiple ins and multiple outs and so on, and there could be a difference between ins and outs, which is the transaction fee. So total bitcoins coming in, total bitcoins coming out, going out, there is a difference, and then there is a transaction fee for that difference. In fact, this is required uh, for, well, I, I'll come to you. This is the incentive for kind of burying a transaction into what is called a, a block. Now, the, the important thing here is how to prevent double spending. So I, I am the owner of a public. I am the owner of a Bitcoin, I have a public key, I want to give it to somebody else. 
So I sign it with, uh, and sign this. Uh, the, 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 there are say, say public key, one public key to which I send it, uh, a transfer ownership by signing the public key of this owner. Now I could also do it for another public key. Right? So I could be using, I could be double spending the same coin. So the, the question is, the main question is, how do you prevent such double spending? Uh, in typical ECAS solutions, there, there would be a centralized trusted authority which would, which would ensure that such things do not happen. Bitcoins avoid that. Uh, the Bitcoin protocol avoids that. They use two concepts. One is this, this notion of a proof of work. The other is a, uh, a, a peer to peer network, a distributed network. Okay. First, let's uh, look at what is called a proof of work. So, a central concept in, in Bitcoins is well, the first is transaction and then a group of transactions which is called a, a block. And blocks are, are chained together. So you have a first block, and then the entire information is in this block is hashed. That this hash value is plugged into the next block, and that entire information is hashed. Then that hash value is plugged into the next block, and so on. So you create what is called a, a chain of a hash, a, 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 a chain of blocks. Now the proof of work is, is in creating this hash value. The goal is to create a hash value of a special form. The special form is that there should be a certain number of leading zeros. Now, if you apply a hash function such as SHA-256, what you will get as digest is kind of a garbage. You know, it's a random looking value. It won't come out with a certain number of leading zeros. So you've got to hash that repeatedly using a slight tweak. That tweak comes via what is called a nonce. So the block itself would have embedded in it a nonce, and you keep on incrementing that nonce, so the block slightly changes and keep on hashing it, and you do it until a desired number of leading zeros come. So who would be doing this? There would be nodes, as I said, there would be a distributed network, and uh, each node would be doing this, this, this is called block mining, it's also called solving the hash value. And uh, why, would, uh, why would a node do this? Well, the incentive for block mining is that the miner gets the transaction fee. So the, the node which first gets the desired number of leading zeros would get all the transaction fees in the, uh, in the transactions that constitute the block. The, the original mining of bitcoins is a similar process. And uh, to ensure that uh, there are not too many block, uh, bitcoins entering the system, uh, this, I mean, the return for creating a new bitcoin has a diminishing incentive. So there is a calculation which shows that uh, how it will go, and then that's how you come to this figure of 21 million bitcoins. Now, uh, doing away with the trusted authority is using this is by using a peer-to-peer -peer network where you have nodes, and all nodes keep complete details of all transactions. Now, of course, there are some engineering issues of how much information you need to store and so on. So maybe you can do away with uh, uh, with old information, but essentially nodes keep complete details of all transactions. And once a transaction is created, it is broadcast to the network. And nodes group them into blocks and chain it into blockchain. And once a blockchain uh, and once a new block is solved, solved in, in the sense that a uh, hash value with leading number of uh, with the desired number of leading zeros is created, this block is then broadcast to the node. So again all the nodes get the same block and then they create then they keep on uh, increasing the blocks. So transactions are considered valid when they're embedded into blockchain of a certain day. So they're not immediately considered valid. So they have to get embedded into uh, a blockchain of a certain day. And ownership of a coin can be verified by querying the network. If you query the network, you get to know who is the current owner. The double spending is avoided by maintaining a public history of all transactions and majority of nodes agreeing to which of the two transactions is the first one. So if you have double spent it and you have sent it to the to the network, then ultimately it will get detected that uh, this this Bitcoin was owned by this particular public key and it has been spent twice. So I mean the nodes would get to detect it, and the the I mean, the, the resolution would be the the majority of the if the majority of the nodes say that a particular transaction is is the proper one. Uh, is the first one, well then that, that's the transaction that would be taken. So this is a disincentive for a, uh, for a person who's trying to do a, a double spending. Now of course one can also think of 
uh, trying to solve this blockchain or working backwards, but uh, working backwards across the blockchain has a, has a, a lot of computational cost. So it's more feasible for the adversary to actually participate in the network, to use its uh, computational resources to participate in the network and uh, create blockchains rather than defeat the system. So anyway, this is a, a brief summary of Bitcoins. And the main important thing here is that the ownership of a coin is transferred by uh, a digital signature, which is essentially the ECDC. OK, now is this uh, bit of formalism part. So unless you are very specifically interested in digital signatures, you can take, a, take some rest. I, I'll again wake you when we come to the more interesting part about e-commerce and a bit of law. Okay. Now, uh, formalism is a, and formalism in, in, in cryptographic uh, designs is a movement which started in the 90s. There was a concerted movement, well, uh, of course, uh, the first, first person to formalize was Claude Shannon, way back in 1946-47. But other than that, uh, and as a general movement of uh, trying to formalize uh, what is meant by security of different cryptographic constructions, that started somewhere in the 90s. The goal is, well, here is a cryptographic functionality. I want to say what it means for this to be secure. That's the first thing we'd like to say. So can I pin, pinpoint a definition? This is the definition of security. And uh, then the second thing is, well, now I have a definition. Can I have a construction which satisfies this definition? So construction, so the, the, the second point is to get a construction. The third point is to show that this construction satisfies this definition, well, that's what is called a proof of security, which is essentially a reduction type proof. So if you are working in digital signatures currently, then if you want to propose a new, new signature algorithm, you'll have to come up with a construction with, a, along with it a proof of security. Otherwise, your paper won't be accepted. <laughs> it's just, just that. Right? Yeah. So it's, if you have any plans to work on digital signatures, at least in the academic domain, then you have to have, have to be familiar with some amount of formal. Okay, so what is what would be a formal security definition? What does it mean to say that a digital signature algorithm or digital signature scheme is secure? This is modeled by what is called uh, an adaptive chosen message attack. This is a game between an adversary and a simulator. So there are two parties. One is a simulator, the other is the adversary. The goal of the adversary is, of course, to be able to forge it, a message signature pair. And the simulator would uh, kind of play the role of a, of a genuine user. Okay. So what does the simulator do? The simulator runs the set of algorithms to generate signing and verification keys. Okay. And then gives the verification key to the key, adversary and keeps the signing key. The adversary. OK, so the, what the adversary can do is, adversary can query the simulator. So it's a chosen message attack. So the adversary can query the simulator on messages of its choice. So it says, OK, give me the signature for this message. Guess back the signature. Then it says, based on this message signature, it says, OK, give me the signature on another message. Get, gets back the new signature and keeps on doing this for, for several times. So some, some bound on the number of queries it can make. And, and at the end, after this interaction with the simulator, it has to output a new message signature pair. And wins if the message signature pair passes the verification with the generated verification. So this is the forge. I mean, the adversary is trying to forge a signature. It's trying to come up with a message signature pair, which it has not seen earlier. And to aid in that, the adversary is allowed to query the simulator on messages, adaptively on messages of its own choice. Now, what could be the type of message on which uh, the adversary can, can forge? Well, based on the type of messages, there are different kinds of uh, signature goals. The first one is this uh, notion of existentially unforgeable. So if the adversary, if the probability of the adversary winning this game, so this, this is the game, outputs a new message signature pair. There is no constraint on the message. Any random looking message and a corresponding signature, if it can come up with such a message signature here, then it wins. Well, this kind of this kind of forgery is called an existential forgery. And it is 
existentially unforgivable. If the scheme is said to be existentially unforgivable, if the probability of this adversary winning the game is small. Now, in a different model, the adversary could be, I mean, the adversary could say that, okay, I will forge on a particular method. This is called selective forgery. The adversary at the outset chooses the forgery method before receiving the verification. If the adversary can win such a, if the adversary cannot win such a game, then it's called selectively unforgery. Universally unforgery is the, ah, okay. Well, this is universally forgery. If the adversary is able to forge signatures on any message, so you cannot forge signature on any message. And a complete trick is if the adversary is able to recover the signing key, then of course it can sign any message of its choice. That's the complete break of the, uh, of the signature. So these are the, the four, uh, four kinds of uh, security notions that one would associate with a signature scheme. And if you can show that uh, a signature scheme is existentially unforgeable under chosen message attack, then it's said to be, then you consider it to be secure. So that's kind of the, the primary goal of, of, a, of showing a digital signature scheme to be secure. Uh, then how do you actually show that a scheme is secure? Well, the argument is essentially a, a reductionist security assurance. So the argument goes like this. If some problem pi is computationally hard, then the main protocol is secure. You have to show such a, such a statement. You have to prove such a statement. Now, along with some problem pi, you could also say some smaller protocols are secure. Also, you can make some, and the, the proof may require to make some additional assumptions, such as random oracle, assuming the hash function to be a random oracle, which is essentially a uniform random function, and so on. But the, the main goal is, if some problem pi is computationally hard, then the main protocol is secure. Can I prove a theorem such as this? And the proof would go via what is called a game sequence, so the, the original game is this game G0, and then you have a, a final game GK, and Xi is the event that the adversary is successful in game GI, and we, we look at these differences. This, this is the, uh, the original success probability of the adversary, and it should be very small here, and these differences should also be very small. So the goal, the target of the proof would be to show that to design such a sequence of games so that this is small and these differences are also small. So this, this goes by and the, the, all, all these proofs essentially have this structure. So this G0 is the game which defines the security of the protocol. So the advantage of the adversary is the probability that A wins in game G0. And GK is designed such that probability A wins in GK is small. And then GI minus 1 and GI do not differ too much. So whether the adversary is playing game GI and GI minus 1, that shouldn't be noticeable to the adversary. I mean, the difference between this probability XI minus 1 and probability XI should be upper bounded by, by something, some, some quantity which is small. Okay, uh, that's the kind of the structure and what are the goals? If you, if you come up with a signature scheme now, what would we be aiming at? Well, one of the aims is to get a short signature. Your signature size requires bandwidth. So if your signature is short, you can show that this is a very short signature, then it requires less bandwidth, and that's a desirable goal. Of course, sizes of verification and signing keys, this is also important, especially if you are doing your verification using a smart card, right, or you're signing using a smart card, then your signing key, having your signing key to be small, because you're storing it on a smart card. So designing a signature scheme which has small signing keys, Verification keys, verification is done by server. So having verification keys to be small is a goal, but not that, that important than goal. Uh, typically, short signatures and short signing keys are, are uh, two, two of the most important goals. And of course, you want fast signing algorithm, fast verification algorithm, and so on. And from the point of view of security, you should be able to base, your secu base the security of your scheme on some well-studied uh, standard computationally hard problem. And then uh, when you do this, if pi is hard, then uh, your scheme is secure. Uh, this, this should be tight, tight in the sense that, well, the, the probability of, of breaking your scheme is upper bounded by the probability of being able to solve the hard problem. And then that should be almost the same. There shouldn't be a 
big difference between these two probabilities. And then whether you use random oracles or not, that's also an issue. So these are more, more technical issues. Now, uh, starting from the year 2000, when Anto Zhu, he introduced uh, this notion of bilinear maps for designing cryptographic protocols. Previous to this, bilinear maps were used for, uh, for solving the discrete block problem of certain kinds of supersimilar elliptic curves. So Zhu was the first person to show that uh, these maps can be used for designing cryptographic protocols. And this has become the main tool for, for a lot of uh, the currently proposed signature schemes. So I'll talk a bit about that. So E is a map from G1 plus G2 to GT, where these three groups are of the same prime order P. And practical examples ar arise from elliptic curve groups. Now, this was generalized to multilinear maps, which arise from lattices. And recent work has shown that, well, the, the proposals for multilinear maps that have come up are not secure. But uh, there is nothing, uh, well, for, for appropriately chosen groups G1, G2, and GT, uh, bilinear maps are still considered to be secure. These maps are called bilinear because of this very interesting property that E of AP and BQ is E of PQ to the power AB. So this is the main algebraic property which uh, makes these maps so very useful in designing, and not only signature, of course, a lot of other protocols. Uh, there are other uh, issues of non degenerate efficiently computable and so on, which are of course important. There are broadly speaking two classes of, uh, uh, of bilinear maps the symmetric maps, G1 equals to G2. Currently, these are not considered to be secure because of recent advances on, on solving uh, discrete lock problem for small characteristic uh, and for fields of small characteristic. Uh, for asymmetric, one would look at type 2 or type 3. And in this case, G1 and G2 are different. And currently, type 3 pairings offer the best performance. Best performance, both in terms of, terms of uh, signing and verification algorithm, and also in terms of signature sizes. Now, I'll mention one of the most more important signature schemes proposed by Waters in 2005. Well, he had pro proposed is using type 1 pairings, symmetric pairings. And signatures consist of two group elements. But the dis disadvantage is that for signing, say, 256 me mes bit messages, the public key consists of about 260 group elements. Ah, OK. OK. I'll finish. Uh, and the security is based on the computational diffusion assumption. And the water signature is very important because this became the uh, uh, basis for many later proposals. And uh, I'll just mention. This one work that I had done with, uh, with Shunji Chatterjee, we had lifted uh, Waters protocol to type 3 pairings. And our main contribution here was to reduce the size of the public key with some, uh, and the trade off is some loss of tightness. OK, so maybe I'll skip this part since I'm running out of time. And I'll come to the maybe more interesting part. OK, so we, we talk about the digital world. Uh, E-commerce and e-government, government or e-governance. These are the two main uh, buzzwords of, uh, of of the present well, government and uh, uh, of business. And digital signatures form the basic building blocks here. Now there is a legal aspect to it. So I, I mean, my physical signature has legal backing. So if digital signatures also need legal backing. And if digital signatures are to be accepted, they also need legal backing. And uh, the United Nations, way back in 1986, realized this. They formulated a model law on e-commerce in 1986. And uh, well, this is the recommendation. They recommended that all states, all members of the UN, give favorable consideration to the model law when they enact or revise their own laws. And uh, in response to this, Many countries, more than 60 country, countries as per 2011 reports, maybe this has increased by now, have enacted laws providing legal force to digital signatures. Uh, on the net, I found Mexico has, in, in, way back in 2000, they didn't, in, in 2000, they didn't really have a, a, a new law. They made, modif uh, and Mexico made modifications to several existing laws uh, to give some legal backing to digital signatures. And in 2011, an advanced digital signature law was adopted. Uh, I tried to find this law on the net. I couldn't uh, 
and the time that I could spend on searching, that time I could not discover this law. But it would be interesting to have a look at it. Now for India, uh, there is an Information Technology Act in 2000, 2006. This I could find on the net and I read it. So I'll talk a bit about the Indian IT Act. It provides legal sanctity to digital signatures based upon the principle of equivalence to handwritten signatures. That's the, that's the, gui that's the guiding force. Uh, it provides for creation and management of PKI in India. And for digital signatures to work, uh, you have to have this uh, structure for PKI. So the IT Act, Indian IT Act, provides for uh, creation of uh, and managing how, how, this, how will PKI work. And of course, once you have a new law, it will have cascaded amendments to several other acts. Of course, it covers other aspects of digital signatures, but then anyway, that's not really important right now. This is the PKI India framework. It's a three-level hierarchy. There is a controller of certifying authorities, which is also called the root CA of India. And then there are <coughs> lower level CAs. The CAs assign uh, certificates to individual users. The CAs cannot assign certificates to lower level CAs. So it's always a three-level hierarchy. You have a root CA, then you have this next level CAs, and then you have users who get uh, certificates from CAs, directly from CAs. And some of the CAs are uh, can give certificates only to specialized users. Say, for, for example, for the banking technology, there is this uh, IDRBD, which, which gives uh, certificates only to the banks. Okay, so that, uh, I think I can skip that. The functions of the CC or the root CA is the creation and maintenance of this root CA of India. And the root CA is a self signed certificate. So somebody, uh, this trust goes, goes back, goes back. But then the, somebody has to be signing its own certificate. So the, in, in, in India, that's the CCA which does that. Does that. And also does a lot of other things, in, including the maintenance of this national repository of digital certificate, copies of all certificates, and certificate revocation lists. It's mandated with the task of maintaining these things. This is all, all, all the lists that exist in the company? Pardon? These all lists are the all this existing in the company? Yes, that's, yeah. that's, 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 their, that's their task. Now, how they're doing it, I don't know. But uh, the IT Act mandates that they are supposed to do it. Now, here is a very interesting thing from the Indian IT Act that I found. Maybe I'll spend some time on it. So, this is a legal definition of what is a secure digital signature. So, if by application of a security pro procedure agreed to by the parties concerned, it can be verified that a digital signature at the time it was affixed, was unique to the subscriber affixing it, capable of identifying such subscriber, and so on and so forth, then such digital signature shall be deemed to be a secure digital signature. So this is clearly a, a definition of what it means for a signature to be, a digital signature to be secure. Now that's how the law would define it. But I've given you a different definition, right? That's the more scientific definition. Now, how does this relate to this definition? I really have no idea. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, you show that uh, the setup, uh, signing, verification, definition in a court of law, you'll be thrown out. In a court of law, you'll have to argue based on this. So that, I think, is something that one can look at. And uh, there are also some illustrations in the Indian IT Act of what constitutes forgeries. So this is a forgery. There are 16 such illustrations. These are forgeries. Now, is it possible to argue from this, from this scientific definition of secure digital signatures that this if a signature scheme satisfies this secure digital, uh, this, this definition, then these forgeries would not arise. Again, uh, it should be possible, but uh, I don't know. I mean, how this the scientific thing would uh, can kind of dovetail with the, the legal requirement is, is something that would be interesting to, uh, to investigate. OK, uh, here is a one slide summary of digital versus physical signature. I think this is uh, it's important that we, we understand the difference. So physical signature is directly linked to what I would say is the cognitive biomechanics. So I'm doing that consciously, and it's a mechanical process, but it's a biomechanical process. Now, a digital signature, the signing algorithm, the signing key is completely divorced from the, from the biological entity. It's just a bit string. And most people don't even know their, and it's impossible to know their uh, bit string. So we'll, uh, I mean, that's, that's an important difference. Now, uh, long-term archival is a serious problem. Uh, technology advances. 
So maybe 20 years from now, what you have signed now, will that, uh, will that be recognizable? Will that be recognizable 100 years from now? Physical signatures, maybe. And then you sign treaties. So if you're trying, signing treaties, do you use digital signature? May not be a good idea. So uh, it's unlikely that digital signatures will completely replace physical signatures. There are scenarios where physical signatures are going to be important. But of course, uh, they offer a, a, a wider range of functionalities, things that I've skipped. There is a digital signature, a zoo, a lot of things that one can do with this, this new promise. OK, now I'll uh, just have five minutes more. Okay. Good. So I'll talk about uh, this. Uh, cryptanalysis is always more interesting than cryptography. Things that you break. OK. The first thing is this malware called Flame. It was reported in 2012. And uh, well, according to certain reports, it was already existing maybe four or five years earlier. So this is supposedly uh, one of the most sophisticated malwares till now. It can, uh, once it affects your computer, it will do, it will, uh, it will grab all your information. It can uh, activate your, uh, this CCD camera, it can become a, uh, an attractor for Bluetooth device. It will download things from open Bluetooth device and send it across to the net. So once it affects your computer, I mean, you yeah, just you become kind of a zombie. I mean, there's nothing that you can do about it. Now, how does this malware get into the, into the computer? Well, that's where the attack comes in. So the attackers identified a Microsoft certificate that was used for signing code updates. So if you remember, I talked about Tor. Uh, Tor downloads code. Now, that code is signed. Okay. So Microsoft also sends you updates across the air. And you can update your software, uh, your Windows system over the air. And this code, are, this, this code fragments are also signed. And th there is a corresponding certificate to it. So uh, the attackers, they identified a Microsoft certificate that was use, used for signing code updates. The signing algorithm used the weak MD5 hash function. So they did not actually break the signature scheme. So it's a hash then sign. And um, the hashing algorithm was MD5. Now MD5 has been known to be for quite some time. but. Uh, because of resistance to change, it was not actually replaced. So the signing algorithm used this MD5, and what the attacker could do was, the attackers created a new collision for MD5. Now this part is, uh, I mean, this is what, about this part, Mark Stevens says, that uh, it's based on world class cryptocurrency. So uh, I mean, chosen prefix collisions for MD5 has been done in the academic world. It has, pub it has been published. And one of the lead authors of that paper is Mark Stevens. He has run a forensic tool on the, on, the, on the collision that has been reported for Flame. And his conclusion is that this is a new kind of chosen prefix attack. So it's not some hacker who is just uh, doing, uh, I mean, just trying to bypass the system and somehow get into it. There, are, there is some good mathematics going on behind it. And in that context, he makes this remark, the design of Flame is partly based on world-class cryptanalysis. So, so designing this uh, this chosen prefix collision is a serious uh, serious crypto academic cryptanalytic work, which kind of lends support to the view that this must have been backed by a, a powerful nation state. Now, based on this prefix collision, this was used to fraudulently sign some components of the ma malware to make them appear to have originated from Microsoft. So the components, so the, when, when the malware comes in, you verify and verify it looks like it's come from Microsoft. The computer trusts it, <laughs> and then, then it's completely gone. So this is one, uh, one forgery. The forgery is by uh, getting a new condition for MD5. Now fake certificates, there are two reported, I've mean, come across two uh, reported fake certificates. One is this Komodo, and the other is DigiNoter. The, both were reported in 2011. Well, Komodo is a, is a reputed certificate selling authority, and Komodo certificates are still used in your browser. So, if you look into your browser, there is an option. Depending on which browser you use, you can look at, you can find all the certificates that are present in your browser and see certificates by Komodo. Well, Komodo also uh, gave out uh, kind of licensed licensed out their activities. 
which they call register authorities, and a user account of one of its register authorities was breached, and then some fake certificates were issued for several popular domains such as Yahoo, Google, Skype, and so on. So Google.com or Gmail, so fake certificates were issued. Now, uh, the thing about these fake certificates is that, well, www.gmail.com. Okay. Now this, you have a certificate for for such a such a domain, but the the resolution of this domain name would go to a would, would be done by a DNS server. So unless you can have the DNS server in your control, I mean, it would get resolved to some some numbers, and the the connection would go to that particular number. If you can control the DNS. Then uh, you can change the numbers, and then it would come to you where you present the fake certificate. Now it was not clear that uh, the DNS servers were compromised. In fact, uh, the the CEO of Komodo mentioned that without controlling DNS servers, this was not very really useful. But uh, the thing is uh, that it was that it was attacked, and it was attacked by one of these registered authorities. Uh, DigiNotar is a more sad story. Uh, was hacked and fake certificates were issued, about 500 have been reported, and then the company went bankrupt. So there's nothing more that it could do. And the last, of course, with, with uh, anything related to cryptanalysis, you have got to bring in Snowden. Uh, 2013, reported by Snowden in 2013, there is an alleged man in the middle attack by NSA. So an internet router was hacked, and certain traffic, certain targeted traffic was rerouted. Okay. Now, if it's rerouted, well, it could be rerouted, but then they, you have to have some fake certificate. Like it's similar to this Komodo thing. Well, you need I mean, the DNS unless you have control over the DNS server, you cannot reroute the traffic. So what they did was they, they hacked into one of the routers and then redirected the traffic. But then they also used a fake certificate to to authenticate. Uh, uh, I mean, like something like uh, W. I think it's Google.com. Uh, so they had a fake certificate for google.com and then the redirected traffic would come to this google.com and would get this google.com certificate and believe it to be correct. Now how did they get the fake certificate? Well there are two theories. One is by Matthew Green who suggests that uh, the NSA could have obtained their own signing key from a less trustworthy CA. So CAs can, cannot have absolute trust on CAs. And Bruce Snyder suggests that the attack could be linked to the fake certificate issue from the DigiNotar hack. So maybe during that phase, it could have got, uh, NSA could have got themselves in. And nobody knows how such a fake certificate was issued. And uh, this gave them a classical man in the middle attack. OK, so this is where I will end. And if I pronounce this correctly, Russia sports the mobile attention. And uh, I'm sure that you have uh, many questions, but we are going to be creative in this time, and don't, then the questions are going to be in the the toast uh, outside, so you can have nice wine and, uh, and food, and then ask questions.